Shop. I'm Dave. I'm going to shoot a little different angle here for fun, whatever. I've uh, got a bunch of little clips that I shot over time. So I'll kind of make a collage here a little bit and I want to share some different things, finds, colors, finishing, a lot of stuff. So here's the video. Alright, just want to shoot this to explain why I'm building an electronic edge finder. Alright, I've got a 3 8 inch collet in there. I've got the edge finder. And I'll tighten that up. I wish I could get a dual camera so that you guys could see the DRO and, um, and the edge finder at the same time. But, alright, suppose you have something in here and you want to face it off, but you want to take off only three thousandths of an inch. If you're trying to make something that's extremely accurate, tight tolerances. So what you're going to do is you're going to run your edge finder. I'm just going to use this for the, for the purpose. So you're going to run your edge finder. And you don't need it that fast. And then you're going to come in until it just pops. Where is it? Faster than that, and this may be break. Ooh, right there. It's all right, back off now. Yeah, there you go. All right, zero out the edge finder. So I'll bring the camera up so you can see the DRO. Where is it? Up there. It's zeroed out. All right, let's go back down to this guy. And bring this out, turn it off, bring it up. What I'm going to do, let's get the spindle lock in there. Let me get this guy out of here. All right. Oh, all right. Edge my news out. Get this collet out of here. Again, this was a 3 8 collet. This is, what is this one? This is. Jeez, you can't read the number. Oh, this is metric. I think this is 19 millimeters. But I'm going to make this thing really upset. This is one, two, four pieces of paper, essentially. So that's quite a bit of offset. Stick this guy in there. So this thing should wobble like crazy. Uh, stick it in there. Oops, the paper's going to get stuck. Yep. Stick that up there. And you're going to have to trust me that I'm not messing with the DRO or resetting it or anything. Come on. There. No. Is that tight? No. Okay, it doesn't move. So I'm pretty clamped down on it. Bring it down. And do it again. A little hard to see when it pops because it's wobbling so bad. Yeah, I can see it's together. Well, you should see it pop. This went, and I'll bring you up to see the DRO. Oh, I should have shut it down. There it is. Zero. It shouldn't be reading that. What it is, is the edge finder is always finding the edge with respect to the center of the spindle. It has nothing to do with anything else. So you're always finding the center of the spindle. Now what happens is, I can zoom out on this. Right. Yep. 
zoom out a bit. So what's happening is, if your cutter is doing this kind of a wobble, and you use the edge finder to find the edge, and you're saying that's zero, and I want three thousandths cut, when you actually move in three thousandths, you're taking a completely different cut because your cutter's doing this number. So what you want is an electronic edge finder because it's going to account for whatever run out you have in your collet or your cutter or whatever because the second it hits at all, period, it's going to light up and it's going to tell you that's where the true edge is. So if you guys don't believe me, run this experiment yourself and you'll see. This was kind of extreme with this, this much paper in here, but um, it's always to the center of the spindle, not the actual edge. Yeah, and another interesting point was I've seen, I don't remember where, wait, man, I still didn't already make this so blue to this piece. I've still got a, uh, I've seen comments someplace that you don't, you're not supposed to spin. Oh, yeah, it's on Amazon in the review section. People saying, you know, um, worthless edge finder because it's spinning and the battery flies out or something like that. And other people are saying you're not supposed to spin it. Well, with what you've just seen, and I'm talking about runout, if you don't spin it, you happen to be on this end of the runout, you're going to be off. You're measuring, you know, say you had 3,000 runout and you happen to be out on it. When you come in touch, you're actually 3,000 that way from the surface. The real edge is three thousandths over there. So yeah, you gotta spin them. Alright, here we are at the bench. And what do I want to go for? Uh, first things first, I guess this guy I was using the other day, a center drill. I don't see anything wrong with it at all, but it was doing some really weird stuff. It was drilling a hole with a bump in the middle of it almost like it was just scraping around here I put another one in there it's about the same size and it did the job right but I ordered another one off of Amazon I guess so I don't know what I don't know what I, I've used this on steel and aluminum but alright so that's that the other thing I guess is this was my dad's and I was did everything I could to restore it. It was really badly oxidized and nasty. I had to punch the pins out to disassemble it to be able to clean and buff it up. But it's just that holding. Eh, it's kind of holding it now, but I used it once and it just kept moving. And for some reason, I was up in my office the other day searching for something and I forgot all about this. I had an entire set that I bought. I think this was in Germany when I was there or something. <laughs> so that was kind of a kick. Just bring that out and used it already a little bit. It's like cool. <laughs> I've got a really nice slick set. <laughs> uh, what else is going on? All right. Yeah, I got a package in the mail today. Uh, seven millimeter from China. Ordered it January 21st, and I just got it today, two months later, March 21st. No idea why I would order just one collet and a 7mm to boot. So I just put on Amazon, missed delivery date, because it was supposed to be here a month ago, February 23rd or something like that. So they, they should refund it, and I don't know whether they want to print the shipping label and charge themselves for it or just say throw it away, but okay, I've got a 7mm collet. Uh, what else is going on? Um, the spindle stop. Ta-da! Cool. <laughs> I think everybody's seen, uh, well, first of all, um, I hate that finish. That nasty, gross, rough-feeling black finish that comes on things. So I put this in the uh, lathe and ran the scotch right over it, and it's really nice. Get all the black off of it. It's nice and smooth. Got rid of the stupid plastic handle. Machined my own aluminum one, and then I painted it red. Um, so hopefully it'll stand out, and I won't try to start the mill with it in there. And then everybody's seen me put in the uh, toaster oven, the blue, 
And I got the chart. It is kind of cool. I found this in, oh yeah, the machinist handbook had this. All the temperatures, like 430 degree, very pale yellow, and goes up 500 brown yellow. So I had put this in the uh, toaster oven because I wanted to blue it to keep it from rusting. And I took it way up to 550, and it should have been dark purple. <laughs> But it didn't do anything. I think he even took it higher, 560. It should have been a full-on blue. But it didn't change colors. And I know it's degreased and stuff. But So, bluing it failed. And um, so I just leave it like this, coat it with grease. Now the red, this stuff is cool. I was looking a long time ago on um, YouTube trying to find some different paints and things for the truck that I project and I ran across something called Duplicolor. There's the can of it. And you get it off of Amazon and it comes in red, what else is there? Red, yellow, green, blue, and a kind of a gray color. And it's clear. You can see right through it. You can see the metal and it really gives a nice finish like it's anodized. And yeah, here's the blue, and I think you've seen the yellow on the mill for the handles, and there's the red. And this is the, it's kind of chipped up, but that's their gray. It more like paint. You don't really, you can't really see through it. So, that was cool. And I painted that, and I've seen, I watched on YouTube how to apply it, and their ad for it, and stuff like that. And they show pictures of people with RC cars painting suspension and struts and stuff. And it really looks hot. But you need, uh, this was just painted this morning. So I can't really scratch it or anything. It takes about three, four days for it to really cure. So you can't scrape it off. But so I can handle it and touch it and stuff. But I don't dare really dink it or anything like that yet. So that's that. I've got a nice now uh, spindle stop. And I was also thinking, I always see in click spring that he's putting that die cam on it. And I know it's tough to get it off. So I just did this for fun. And I want to wait until it really dries for a couple of days. And it, maybe it'll keep, this is aluminum, but maybe it'll keep steel from rusting. And it gives it a nice, a nice blue. I kind of like the color. It's like a purplish blue or something. So that's really cool. And on the, um, um, what is it? One of the videos I did a long time ago, I had asked people to send in pictures. I only got one. One person responded. So let me put the pictures up. And here's the first one. This is from Jason Hallman's Inventions. And I'm not sure whose mill that is, but it lo really looks close to, uh, unless he's changed the motor out on it, because it really looks like the, the Grizzly and probably the Harbor Freight. But really nice workshop. Nice clean counters. I love it. Next picture is his lathe. And he's got the whole stack of metal gears there. Just nice. Wow, look at all the... Um, yeah, how organized he is. He's got all the tool holders are lined up. And again, I don't know whose lathe this is. What is oh, that's a four-jaw in there. Four-jaw chuck, cool tool uh, tool post. Really nice uh, shot. And then the last picture, you can see everything all organized. It's great. Thank you, Jason. That's really cool. All right. And next up. I was wondering now that the um, <clears throat> now that the lathe is really kind of fine-tuned and stuff like that, I went back to some of the materials that I had shown in a really early video of how I finish different metals. And there were some metals that were really bad, so I went back to those and remachined them and got gorgeous finishes. This is I'm not sure if you can really work see that. That was the original cut a long time ago, and this is now with the lathe all tuned out. So I started wondering, what is it about these different materials that makes them nice and easy or nasty to machine? And this one, this is 4140 right here. 
So I started writing down their hardness, and lo and behold, the worst one for me to try to get a finish on is 1018. And it turns out 1018 is the softest. It's 64,000, I guess they call it PSI. So I'm putting them in order going, oh yeah, 1018 was the worst, and 64K. The next one up was also hard to finish, 12L14, it's 78K. And then A36 was hard to machine, and that was 80K. But I've got a good finish on it now. I, the only one I still can't finish nicely is the 1018. Here's the 4140, which is a nice finish now, and that's getting up to 80K. Uh, no, 95K is 4140. Stainless 304 is uh, 75. And that was a real nice finish. 1144 is uh, 115,000 PSI, titanium, and W1. And I got a beautiful finish on W1, which is 244,000 PSI. So I was thinking, you know, titanium, 138. I should be able to machine titanium. So I did order a piece of titanium here. And it should, uh, what, I think it was a quarter inch rod, maybe a half inch. It was fairly cheap. And so if I can machine titanium, then I see on eBay you can get like a one inch piece, a one inch diameter, three inches long for 10 bucks. And I can make some titanium rings. That would be awesome. So it seems like the softer the material is, the harder it is to get a nice finish on it. So, okay. Last thing. Um, what it, this was HP Pavilion X2. These are really cool tablets. This is not only a tablet. Because I guess, where's all the... All the apps are over here, right? Oh, get it over there. Oh, I forgot where the apps are now. Okay, there's a bazillion apps in here. There they are <laughs> that you can install. So you basically have a tablet. Um, the other thing, how do you get back out of this? Or this way? <laughs> I'm using the wire. Oh, there's my PC. Desktop. It's a full PC. And it's pretty fast, too. I think I showed this insider program. Come on. Launch, there you go. Start scanning. Inside of program scanning. But you can see it's it's you know I'm fast. I can pull up Word, I can pull up the internet. I'm kind of far away from the router right now, so the signal strength should be yeah, pretty good. Um so these they're only uh, two three hundred dollars for these guys. So you got a tablet, you've got um, a PC, a laptop here, um, with everything. To, to boot. Um, what's the other cool thing here? A lot of people don't know. Uh, keyboard. Gee, there we go. Bam. Rid of that. Oop. Oh, come on. Where'd it go? There it is. Let me do this off screen so people can't see the password here. I want this. Oh, come on. Plug in. You are plugged in. I had this problem before for some reason. It's not mating. There we go. This is Time Warner Cable, so if you... What? I didn't type it wrong. Okay, if you have Time Warner Cable and you're watching TV or whatever, you can create an account where you can watch TV on your um, laptop, desktop, whatever you want. Here, it's loading ABC right now. Loading, loading, it's still far away from the router. There you go. There's full TV and all their channels are here. So you can scroll through, there's hundreds of channels. It's ridiculous. So, Time Warner Cable, and I've been watching the morning news out here on my tablet and stuff. It's great. So. Alright, uh, I think that's everything that I want to share. So, alright. Later.